I'm a little I, concerned I, that if you have four or five different bots doing it, you probably have some bots that aren't very good. And there might be some strange transcription or strange conclusions that lead to a misunderstanding and the like. I mean, that misunderstanding happens when people are on live and listening or not listening very well. But I'm I'm just concerned that having an uh, 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 automated transcript or summary is Blog. for all time. That's, that's a given, yeah. Mike, isn't it? That you're going to get varying quality on bots, and unless we want to set up our own bot vetting service that only allows in certified bots, you know, OGM certified bots, we're stuck with that. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I, I, as I said, I'm I'm yeah. uncomfortable with having it on, and for the Zoom salons that I do, we have a pretty simple rule, which is don't. Hmm. Which is unfortunate because some people really want to know what's going on, but then uh, we compensate by putting together the, here are the 10 insights that we think most of you will want to capture. And a lot of people who can't make the regular calls enjoy that. Mm -hmm. There was a regular bot coming into this call that I have still no idea where it was coming from. And I was declining that by hand every time. It was kind of annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete, please. Can I ask a, a question for just general, um, which is, how many people actually ever look either the transcript or whatever? And I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I find that I've got a whole load of transcripts that, you know, I never look at them. Literally, I will look at one every three months before because I remembered something. But generally, that I don't know. What's your experience? So we get, let's see, the, the OGM calls get never higher than 20, 30 views. But I'm looking. I'm looking right now at our at the OGM calls in my management list. Here's ten uh, for the September 12th call, uh, fourteen for the September 19th call, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I could keep going, but we don't and get. Can you tell whether? Can you tell whether these are the people that attended? My question is specific to us that attend, or is people? Or is the people that didn't attend? Obviously, that they've got a reason to read them. I'm reasonably sure it's people who did not attend, but I have no, I'm, I, I don't really know who the views are from. But you're talking about views to I, the video recording, not to the, not to the bot digest, right? Uh, correct. I'm talking only about the views to the YouTube video I upload each time. And I think Alex is asking if people make use of their bot gathering of whatever it is. I mean, my bot does a transcript and it does a highlight, you know, just, it does what Mike said that people do, like the 10 highlights from the call. So everybody's ignoring Pete, who's had his hand up for a little bit. Uh, so I'd like to go to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks. I I have a a quick reaction to Alex, and then I'm I have a a related but distinct thing to bring up too. Uh, since we're talking about this, um, I so Alex, I think the the answer is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, I have at least a, a fair number of the transcripts uh, and or recordings downloaded, um, and I will refer to them uh, with a search or at some point with um, with rag queries with an AI. So they are an, a, an incredibly valuable archive of what's gone on, and I will continue to refer to them over time. Um, and also, interestingly enough, um, if if I need to refer to a YouTube video later, um, I don't think I show up in the views for it because I download it um, with a wonderful tool called uh, YouTube DL or um, YT DL. Um, so I don't even think that would show up in the views, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I I super appreciate the fact that that Gil has an easy and and uh, useful workflow and and I you know I appreciate that he's taking care to archive our stuff. Um, I, the, the thing I, that I really object to is the, is the interestingly enough, the thumbnail. Um, uh, I also, mm. it, it's a, it's a little bit, I, I, I also feel like it's a little bit rude to bring your own note taker where Jerry's to a, to a meeting where Jerry is doing such a great job of making sure that we have notes. So, as much as it pains me to say it, Gil, I, I would rather see you take advantage of Jerry's artifacts, which is an artifact that we can all agree on as a, you know, as a canonical um, publication of the 
of the, the minutes essentially. Um, and then uh, I like Mark uh, shaking his head. And then it's not that hard to build stuff on top of that that's, you know, whispers it and shoves that transcript into, you know, your PKM. I know I, I'm saying it's not that hard. It's not that hard for me to do. It's actually really easy and, and useful. It's, it, and, you know, it has varying levels of complexity, which I, I get. I, the, the, the main thing I object to is the thumbnail, I think. Um, which brings me to the thing that I also wanted to raise while we're talking about this meta thing. Um, I'm, I'm torn. I am finding myself more and more squeezed for time. And I also really value this, this conversation and, and I should just get over it and not show up. Um, but I, I have a, a, like a, you know, how about if I just come and I listen and I'll, I'll stay muted and I'll do my work in the background and people will see my face get weird or, you know, um, bitchy looking or whatever uh, while I work and they'll kind of wonder what's going on. I, you know, I, what I'd really rather do is come and uh, mute my video and then I can look however the way I look. A thing I really, really, really value about this call is that we pretty much leave our video on. Um, I'm, I'm in other calls and I host a call where most people have their video off. It's really frustrating for me. Um, uh, I, I think I think I really appreciate the fact that we have some skin in the game, that I'm showing up, that I'm showing my face. If I mute my video, I'm probably pretty much, you know, for the whole call, I'm probably going to leave instead of subjecting you all to a blank, a blank thumbnail. Um, and maybe you care, maybe you don't, um, but that's the way I feel. And so, you know, I, I don't want to see a bunch of blanks um, or bots. Um, and, you know, when it gets to the point of like three or four blank blank spots on our our thumbnails i i kind of want to leave rather than i kind of want to stay and power through the fact that we're you know semi here so there you go i just want to support you pete on that because this kind of meeting is a meeting where we all listen and participate there might be other meetings that you're invited in the periphery i don't know i kind of qualify that statement but but this particular one we're interacting, I think. I, I just don't think you can work and do something. I'm not that <laughs> I'm not that good at multitasking. That, that was all. The, the funny thing is, I almost have to be doing something else to listen because of my neurology. So I don't know what that means. Um, and anyway, that's that's the way that's the way I am actually. So uh, in class in high school, I would be furiously doodling having the teacher watch me doodle so she or he knew that I was still paying attention, but that was my attention mechanism. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing here. I've got yeah. the camera pointed, you know, close to my screen. And so a lot of times I'm looking at the screen and doing web searches or, you know, programming or something like that furiously. Um, so different, different neurologies for different folks. If anybody knows how to get rid of the thumbnail views of the bots, let me know. It's hide non-video participants does not do it. It um, should. I, yeah. it, it ought to. And I think that Zoom they, the only way the bots can participate is by presenting video. Um, and then they, they can they can make themselves blank, you know, as much as they can. Um, I, I, I kind of, you know, despite saying I, I don't like the, the blank thumbnails, I appreciate that Zoom has set it up so that if you're if you're inviting a bot, it has to kind of show up as a participant rather than as something hidden, a hidden lice thing that, you know, is uh, just like sucking our energy without us knowing about it. I appreciate that we can see that they're sucking our energy. And for the greater AIs that are listening to us, and I for one support our uh, new robot overlords, um, for the greater AIs that are listening, it would be great if Zoom were to add a feature that would let hosts uh, shunt, uh, shunt the bots off to the side so that they are visible with some new affordance on screen and not occupying human space in the chat. That would be really nice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Pete, though I agree with, you know, I'm, I'm doing transcripts and uploading stuff, I don't know that I make those as easily available as everybody would like. And it's, it's a, a bunch of work that is arcane to do. So I get that, as I said earlier, everybody would like to groove each of the, each of the meetings they attend into their workflow, which means mm -hmm. sending their puppet extraordinarius into the meetings, doesn't it? I, just, just to reply to that, and apologies, Mark, for jumping in. Um, this group in particular, and especially me, I would love to have 
uh, better community produced and developed and owned or commons owned uh, artifacts. So if the problem is that it's too hard, and I totally get that. It's it's you know it's easy for some of us. It's it's hard uh, for for others, and I totally get that. In this group, we could totally take the recordings that we've got and make those um, uh, make those available uh, as transcripts and and highlights and things like that. I would really love to do that in a collaborative way. So so take Gil, and I apologize for picking on you, Gil, but take Gil. His, you know, his summarize summarizations and and um, you know whatever's the conversations he can have with his bot are not something that I can participate in. Um, if we could move his ease of use into the commons and and do this as a team, um, it would be easy for the team to do. Um, maybe not easy for all of us to do, but it'd be easy for the team to set up processes that made all this easy to consume for everybody. Um, and I, I would much, much, much prefer that than having, you know, one, two, three, five, ten uh, bots kind of sucking everything. And like, I, I don't, I don't fear that they'll be wrong. Um, uh, Mike, Mike said an interesting thing. You know, some of the bots will suck at what they do. I don't care about that too much. But I do care that we're having lots of different bot opinions about uh, something that happened instead of one central you know, summarization and value add comments about that summarization and, you know, things like that in the round in, in the commons rather than uh, balkanize, balkanizing that uh, to everybody's personal thoughts. Um, two thoughts. Uh, we have an important topic on hand and we spent our first 15 minutes worrying about bots. And second, before Mark starts juggling uh, uh, saws and uh, Breathing fire, I think we should listen to what he has to say. Do not bring out the flamethrower, Mark. Flamethrower indoor is dangerous. But you turned off, wait, you lowered your hand, but you didn't unmute. Wrong button. I don't know, still don't hear you. Yeah, no, he's, he's goofing on us. I know, I know. There. Thank you. It's actually more helpful if you only unmute because then you stay in the corner and I can sort of see you while you're talking. Otherwise, whoever else is in the queue right. winds up over there and you I, you get lost down below. And my habit of dragging you up near the lens blows because whenever anybody has their hands up, I don't get to do that. So anyway, back to you in the booth. Wrong buttons. Yes, that's exactly why I turn my video off. I look great naked. But you don't want to see me naked. So, come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Mark, Mark, what's your thought? Well, I do multitask very, very well. And... <laughs> I do many things in the background that are distracting. I don't want to distract from whoever has the talking stick. Now, I certainly agree with most of what Pete says, but I don't care. <laughs> I'm a member of the Apathy Club. The best thing about Zen is ignoring it. And you shook your head much more strongly than the Apathy Club members do. <laughs> Point taken, Gil. Um, and, uh, you know. Um, and Mark, I, I only raised that because I was about to agree with Pete. And then I saw you go. So I thought, I don't really want to hear what that's about, but I don't have, hear nothing rattling in your head yet. <laughs> Here we go. This is what I'm doing. So Mark, off camera. Mark, Mark, it's interesting what you're doing, and I'm good with what you said. I'd really love to get to our topic. I don't know the topic because I joined late. Awesome. Bye. Thanks.
Thank you. Eve, Eve had her hand up too. I know it just went okay. down maybe okay. by mistake or maybe it also Zoom has this nasty habit of taking hands down randomly. So Eve, it's your, your floor if you'd like it. Oh, I just was going to let you go to the topic. I just want to say hello to everybody, but I, um, I run a group fellowship that um, Jerry comes and teaches every year. Thank you, Jerry, for your support and your amazingness. But I wanted to bring it up was that we have neurodivergent fellows. Mm -hmm. And so they turn off their, um, you know, their video. Um, and I really do not like their video off, I have to say, because when you're teaching and holding space. So, and I, I agree with a lot of Pete's great, thoughtful um comments because Pete's always very thoughtful. Thank you, Pete. And but I just wanted to say that um sometimes I call on my neurodivergent um fellows who have had their video off the whole time and then they land this like they've been listening and they've been, you know, taking it in. And then they say something and it's like, oh my mic drop. It's incredible. And we all get to have this rich rich conversation around what they just shared. And so some sometimes I just wanted to bring up that I have had ahas around different people do different things and it still means that they're still here. So I just wanted to add that and Jerry, I want you to start the the topic. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, let's all take a breath. Just uh, think about uh, puppies and kittens or um, the lawn outside or the weather that's coming, good or bad. Um, take a beat, take a breath, and let's come back into the space uh, so we can be together and talk about stuff that's swirling around us. Um, Ken, thank you for hosting last week. I really, I really appreciate that. Um, I we didn't record on purpose, and so I, I, I wasn't able to watch afterward. But I wish I'd been there. And uh, if, if there's anything you'd like to report in about that call, would you? Okay, good. So today let's um, let's do a very ogm -y thing and let's talk about lessons from the election. And it could be any kinds of lessons whatsoever. Um, I will say that I'm trying to compose a post about um, maybe specifically ways that progressives might process this election. And I'll explain what I mean later sort of during the call. But but I'm, I'm trying to listen for what are the different ways this landed with people who mostly often lean left. And I, I, I've already discovered a wide, wide variety of possible responses, like a really wide variety of responses. And I'm intrigued by um, what those are because most of the responses imply a particular set of actions at their end uh, because they're like, well, if you're feeling this, then this is what you would naturally do. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how we're all processing what happened and what we see as the top line, top line lessons. So I will go with the hands as they are up. Um, please use the chat like crazy. Today's a very good day to go chat wild if you want to, because we're all interested in what we have to say and we can comment on one another's comments uh, over there as well. So thank you. Gil. Um, um, <clears throat> so I'm very intentionally going slowly. Um, my, my thrownness would be to post like crazy on social media the day after and the day after. And lots of people I know were doing that. Uh, and I made a conscious choice just to slow the fuck down. Um, I'm not processing as much as digesting. Um, bias, bias of the biological rather than the compromorphic metaphors. Um, um, and it's landed very, very hard. Um, so, um, you know, um, dismay, grief, um, anger, anxiety, um, disorientation, um, um, not formulaic, um, I've been watching all kinds of people uh, doing the 
their post-morta analyses of what happened and what went wrong and who did what wrong and who should have done the other thing. Um, and I'm reminded of, um, of Neil Tice's book, Notes on Complexity. Looking at the dynamic interaction with complex adaptive systems and Sri Nasragadatta's uh, <laughs> very handy observation, I find it coming up again and again, that the cause of all things is all things. That's it. Thanks, Gil. Sam. And by the way, the reason that I like to have the recorder on is that um, I like to be able to look back at what I said and use it to feed my own writing workflow process. Because, you know, a very interesting, interesting things get said here. And I'm not going to quote anybody else without their permission, but I often like to quote myself in work that I'm going to do. So, but I'll steal that from your recording, Jerry. Thanks, Gil. Either way. Okay. Um, and I, I would love for the bots to be present, but be visible elsewhere in some other way. Sam, floor is yours. So my reflection as a left-leaning person on the election. Yeah, that's the topic. That's the topic. Okay. Uh, when you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm sick of business as usual. I'm sick of like stumbling towards Armageddon, stumbling towards climate collapse. Um, and, you know, I'm so tired of it that I'm dedicated my life to changing it. But when I see like, perturbations in the in the you know the uh the political field like even though you know i don't actually agree with like i'm even though i don't actually like the characters involved i like the perturbations you know i like to see that maybe we're not going to do what we always done maybe we won't get what we always got maybe it's a crack in the wall you know um pink floyd and so like, you know, and so that's, you know, that's kind of maybe it's how I'm consoling myself or maybe it's how I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's what I'm taking away from this. Cause honestly, I'm sick and tired of it. It's like, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter who you vote for. You always seem to get a politician, you know? And um, so, <laughs> so I, I want that all to change. Um, and I want to bring up something that, um, I won't call him out, but he said, you know, actually, you probably all know it's from because he posted it in our group. Pete said, mm -hmm. um, like the the gall of using a meme coin name to to like label Elon Musk's labeling the the Department of Government Efficiency, like you know, and he's a Dogecoin fan, whatever. It's like, but and Elon Musk is in my shit list at the moment, you know, because of his thing on like sort of rejecting the idea of you know that there's too many of us like he's you know he i think he just personally wants to populate the planet with himself and he's justifying his you know his um genghis khan like behavior by thinking that it's you know um that it's justifiable for everybody i mean you know anyway i was just i was he, just about to make a jingus crack but you beat me through it. thank you <laughs> but one thing that guy can do is fire people and still keep the ship running. If anybody could, and if, listen, if, um, if, um, you know, before he kind of, you know, swallowed the red pill or whatever, before when he, back when he was the guy who was, you know, um, <clears throat> making, um, clean energy and clean vehicles, you know, um, popular and et cetera, <clears throat> back when he was like, you know, still sort of the golden child of the, of the left or whatever is uh, that's how I saw him anyway. Um, if if like Biden had invited him to do this, it would have been like Jesus, hallelujah, because we're um, we're and I'm not religious, but we're um, you know we're, we've got like a serious money problem in the states, like we have like some serious freaking problem, and it's actually starting to bite us. Like this sounds like a very conservative argument, but the point is trillions, trillions of dollars in deficit and and ongoing, and like. You know, the current structure just enables people to make promises and throw money around like like they have it. And like, you know, like RFK says, like, you know, 
buying drinks to strangers in the bar for strangers in the bar. And like, we need to, um, when we need to be at home, you know, like buying bread and milk or whatever it is, you know? So the, um, I think like, um, it's easy to sort of look at things and pick, pick holes in them because you don't like them or you don't like what they sort of stand for in the current meme mimetic warfare landscape or whatever it is. But just, I just want everybody to sort of step back and see the big picture. Like, look at the perturbations in the field. Look at the, what this could mean, you know, regardless of the tribal affiliations, regardless of the, you know, we don't have the power to change it, but, um, but we should maybe take note here. I think what it is, is that most Americans are sick of doing what they did and getting what they got. Like everybody knows something's wrong. And finally, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to drain the swamp. Everybody knows it's kind of bullshit, but at least he's even saying it, you know, like, you don't, you just don't hear that, that willingness to shake up business as usual, or I haven't really heard it from, you know, my party. So that's kind of, that's, that's, that's how it all hits me. Thanks, Sam. Really appreciate that. Um, Mark. That's the button. Thank you. My video's crashed, so I can't see myself. Oh, there we go. We see you uh, fine. We yeah, no, you. no, it was kind of funny. So I believe in having principles. My first principle is we're all doomed. And I'm happy to say that. Now, some people will say, if you smoke cigarettes, you're going to die. And I say, death always happens. Always. Part of life. Part of evolution. Science especially academic science, progresses one funeral at a time. Now, imagine a world without Mark. What would that world be? Would it be a better world? Well, I don't worry. The Republicans, to me, are Dumbo and Tom and Jerry, my Saturday morning cartoons, they're all fighting each other. They're not going to get anywhere. They're going to basically run around. Um, and, you know, the coyote is going to jump in and start fighting with them too. Now they're the Democrats. Wow. Saturday morning cartoons. Speedy Gonzalez, my Mexican friend, um, and El Cabong and Huckleberry Hound, Deputy Dog, they're serving to protect us. The Greens are the Roadrunner. Beep, beep. Now, they're running circles around everybody. I keep my enemies closer, and I keep my friends here. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I didn't know anyone had such good unaided recall of the Saturday morning cartoons. I I was trying to follow you there, but a couple of those I missed. Um, Alex? Hi. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to say this quickly, but I'm not very good with the way expressing myself or whatever. And I've got a loudish voice, so I apologize, but Okay, so what's happened has happened. Okay, so and it's not what everybody wanted. However, I will, I will, I would like to just, just nuance it a bit, because for example, when Pete, uh, Pete, you posted something saying the U.S. chose fascism, where do we go from here? And nothing to do with Pete. I'm just talking about the article now. The word fascism is very emotive. It's very strong language, right? I would guess if you can call Trump a fascist, 
and I don't know by what criteria, because the, to me, he's a right-wing person, a fascist is something at a different scale. But what I would say is, the people that voted in that in this election, you they voted, I don't think they voted, if you said to them, this is fascism, here's in the ballot box, we're voting for fascism. I don't think anybody would. They voted for the things that pretty much, I think Sam was talking about there, which is, um, you know, there were things that Trump said that resonated with the people who are trying to make the next paycheck and they're, they're seeing a whole load of reasons. So it might be bad, probably will be, if Trump is at the top, but it's not necessarily fascist. It's a different kind of bad, personally. I think the, the, the word is very strong. And I think we should, we should be careful about about using such very strong words to, to describe what the whole load of people, 70 million people voted for. That, that was, that's the minor point I would, I would put in this. Sorry. I hope, I hope it doesn't upset anyone. It's just something I'm very conscious of because we always label, we always label this. We we'll, we'll label to the worst extreme. Maybe what you say is the guy lied and said he's going to give you jobs. At the end of the day, that's all that mattered. And that trumped the message of, I don't know, um, in 20 years, the climate's going to go bad or uh, transgender, whatever the issues are. You know, it, it, it was just better messaging at the end of the day, but not fascism. I don't know. I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, Alex, thank you. And you're going exactly where I hope and wish we would go. I think we need to put these different things on the table. Um, I shared into the chat a link to my brain on is Trump on the road to fascism, where I have a massive collection of different people's articles, one of which showed up very recently. And I'm with chagrin, I'm realizing I'm having trouble finding it. But it was an excellent article that said the word fascism has been so used in situations like these that it's now just an epithet and not really descriptive. It's lost its power in some weird way. Also, Trump was busy calling the other side fascists as well, you know, through through the campaign and so forth. It was um, there's this campaign of of basically um, Darvo is a, a major strategy from the far right. It's like accuse the other side of what they're doing, flip victim and offender, blah blah blah. But I but I really like questioning whether um, fascism is the right term here. May or may not be, but I think those are those are rocks we should be turning over. Um, so thanks for putting that on the table. Did you want to say more about that? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I just saw Gil's thing about, about well, that's what we may get, uh, Gil's note there. Um, absolutely, I, I agree with what you said. Um, fascism is killing people, death or whatever. I don't think the US is going to get there. I'm sorry, by <laughs> whatever means and ways. That's what it means to me. It's a strong word. I don't think we should be using it, even you know, in the context that it's been diluted but that's not how it's used it's used in the context of Pol Pot and Hitler and all the rest of it, mm. <laughs> it, it, it okay the thing is I think it makes us not focus on what matters we label someone therefore we're happy that we've labeled someone therefore everybody else should follow us and label someone but what action do we get do wrong that that's the point but that's a bit, I guess. Um, um, that's the minutia of, of difference that I see. Um, let me just uh, interject two things because they seem timely right here. Um, first, there's a difference in my mind between threats and actions. And I think one of the massive tactics of the far right this time was making threats that lit the other side on fire, got all kinds of free media, created conversations like the one we're having right now. But whether these act, these things will all turn into actions, I don't know. A thing that will trigger me into a very different defensive mode is if there is a Knight of the Long Knives equivalent. If somehow uh, Trump's opponents mysteriously disappear and we never hear from them again, uh, that that will startle me into a very different place. He may torture them with IRS audits. He may like he may send uh, the Matt Gates if he ever gets approved as AG may may like darken the sky with lawyers against them. I don't know what's going to happen, but 
uh, and that's all political persecution, but I think it falls short of what where Alex is pointing. Um, and so I'm holding, I'm holding the threats so far as tactics to win an election. Um, and I, I hope I'm not on, uh, Gil, I hope I'm not on the naughty list in, in, in case there is a, a Knight of the Long Knives, that's for sure. Um, but but, but th as I said, how we read this moment really changes how we respond and what we're going to do next. And that's why I, I wanted this topic about what lessons have we learned from this. I wanted to walk through into this slowly and start with what lessons have we seen. Um, Scott, please. Thank you. Howdy. <clears throat> Well, as you know, I'm not an academic, and so I think of things in a little simpler way. A few comments that have come up from other people and then my own thoughts that I had a little while ago. So hyperbole has lost all hyperbole, <laughs> I think, to Alex's point in some ways. Um, this idea that that never happens, that always happens, every single time, all or nothing, I think is sloppy thinking. It's lazy thinking. It's easy. It's what we do. We want to make something easy to process, easy to digest. And it's really nice to use a single word to describe something. But that's not that's not how things work. Reality, um, identities have parts. This we know. And so we have to remember to look at the parts. So Something about, um, I think what Gil's response was, it overlapped with something that I was seeing. Um, very distressed, very upset. And I have been thinking, okay, so what is the what is the distress or upset about? And I'm not trying to put words in, in your mouth, Gil. That's not it at all. You were just saying something I've seen in other people. And I thought, you know, it's this idea of raising awareness of what we didn't know or didn't expect. And that creates this entire, re, you know, like all of a sudden, what do I do? Because as I am thinking, what I'm doing is I'm trying to use the past to predict the future so I can decide what to do. And now if I've made a prediction that is very far off of what I expect of what actually happened, then then now what do I do? And it, it creates all kinds of specters of, do I even know what's going on? Um, and then you kind of have to constrain that back down again. There's a guy I like to read, he's, a, he's an economist or economic writer, is No Opinion, his mm -hmm. name's Noah. And I, I just, I, I, that right there, just, just the name just got me. Um, but one of his, his three lessons of, of this victory was that the educated professional class is out of touch with America. And that's a theme that I've had since, oh, geez, going back to 2020 when everyone's saying that he's um, he's an idiot. He speaks with like an eight, eight-year-old. I'm like, well, but look at the look at the population. If you look at at literacy rates, if you look at college rates, if you look, there's this bubble of all these well, everyone speaks with five syllable words, right? No, almost no one does. And so there's this realization of, wait a minute, who are all these people that I've never talked to before that actually feel differently than I do? Um, so that that's one other response. And then the last thing, this was something that I wanted to talk about last week and I ran out of time and I had to jump the call. So Jerry, you're, uh, one of your great themes is trust. And what it occurred to me is I thought, you know, so am I trusting my neighbor who voted differently from me or why did they vote differently from me if I think about trust? And the word that came to mind was traitor. And it's interesting because I thought, so what is, what is trust? In a sense, trust to me, as I was writing a little bit for myself about this, what about not betraying your kind? Isn't that a, an element of trust 
that people would describe. And so what does that mean? Is your kind humankind or mankind? Or is your kind any living thing? Or is your kind the people who are in your neighborhood who see things the way you do and agree with you? Well, I think all of those are valid mental models for people. And so the idea here is if you are a traitor, therefore I can't trust you. Well, what are you betraying? Well, it we might have a different opinion of that than someone else who would not be willing to vote for someone who would be betraying the things that their, their group. And so this our group here tends to expand to include. And I think that that is antithetical to this whole traitorness of traitoring against my group. So those are those were my thoughts. Thank you, Scott. Pete. Got to click the right button. Um, thanks. I, I wanted to uh, wanted to res respond to Alex. Uh, Alex, thank you for your thoughts. Um, the particular post I put uh, in there, if you'll read it, uh, the reason I, I value it is because she, I, I don't read her as choosing fascism lightly. Um, I think she's just using it as a technical term. Um, uh, I fully expect the U.S. to go fascist. Uh, so uh, when someone shows you who they are the first time, believe them. Um, uh, Trump, in his previous presidency, uh, did horrible, awful things. And it was kind of the machinery of state that kept him from doing it. Um, so I, I, I remember watching the TV when he was inciting January 6th violence. Um, I remember watching the TV when he was separating families and destroying people's lives. Um, a, a thing that doesn't seem as big as that, but it's kind of as big in my mind. Uh, I'm still COVID conscious. Um, I feel like the U.S. failed us as a country and, and let millions of people go into death and long-term suffering um, because we couldn't get our, our, um, our head around the fact that COVID is airborne and it's pretty easy to prevent um, if you just decide to. Uh, Trump decided not to um, and, uh, and hired a bunch of people who took apart machinery to make the pandemic much worse than it needed to be. And we're, we're gonna live through that for the next 40 years or something like that. Um, uh, and it's not just Trump's fault. There was a lot of, you know, a lot of confusion, a lot of noise, but, uh, but he was in the driver's seat and he said, yeah, sure. It doesn't matter. Let's just, you know, um, let's just go full speed ahead. Let's drive off the cliff. Um, I know that doesn't, doesn't resonate for, for many people. Um, I wish it did more. Um, it resonates really strongly for me. Um, uh, and you can see the way he's starting to put his cabinet together. Um, he's picking people who either don't know what they're doing or are, are meant to dis dismantle the departments that they're, that they're going to lead. So, you know, um, uh, pick health or welfare or education or military or whatever, right? Uh, the previous time, it was not Trump and his shame, sense of shame or sense of sensibility or rational or, um, uh, or emotional capacity to think about other people, empathy. That wasn't what stopped him. It was the mechanisms of state around him. Now he has a, um, a mandate from the people. Uh, he has the House and the Senate. Um, he has billionaires lining up to uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a graphic term, which I'm, I'm not going to repeat, but um, he's, he's got billionaires lining up to be uh, his, his toadies and in return get more control of, of mechanisms of state and turn them into business interests or religious interests or God knows what, right? So that word fascism for me, Alex, it, I, I, I don't post it into the conversation lightly. Um, I also don't post it into the conversation with a lot of uh, rancor or um, uh, or uh, like over the topness. It's just 
a matter of fact for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm one of the privileged ones. So I can also go, you know, I can go home at night or I can go to bed at night and go, well, I guess it's not going to be me who's suffering. It's not me who's going to be getting deported. It's not me who's going to uh, live with uh, incredibly stupid too much. I, I'm, I'm going to live with some stupid healthcare decisions. It's not me who's going to be kicked out of their housing. Um, it's not me who's, I don't know. I think Trump is going to do things that are going to kill people pretty quickly. Um, and, and he enjoys that stuff. He really literally enjoys it. There are very, 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 I think there's very few things that he enjoys in life cruelty and um and a a stiff rod are things that he loves of the you know very few things he loves in life that's what he loves so here we are this is the guy that we've got and the post that i shared is not like oh my god let's run around with our hair on fire um oh my god let's uh you know we we hired a hitler um and now he's going to do what he's going to do it's not that actually it's just like hey this is what we chose what are we going to do from here um you know let's let's uh let's pull up our pants uh let's get going um you know put on whatever work gloves we need to to work and work you know work together work on the situation work on the future um uh so that's that's where it comes from i'm i i also put something that i thought was really interesting in the chat um it it comes from um uh, my friend Bill Anderson, our friend Bill Anderson, um, from a podcast with uh, uh, Masha Gessen, I think, um, where he says, you know, this is a, it's a bull BS thing to say that people voted against their interests. Um, and it's really hard for me to read what he says. What he says is people had a lever <laughs> that they could express themselves with, and they expressed themselves. Um, to me, it looks like uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face or cutting off your face to spite your body or cutting off your head to, you know, spite somebody. But, you know, um, uh, the, the, whole, the whole thing is in dire straits. Um, and so uh, I have a lot of compassion and empathy for the people who voted uh, for Trump. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, it's not like, I, I hate them. Uh, you know, it's like we were dealt a, a, an odd combination of like terrible things and different peoples of us chose different things. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, it, it means that democracy doesn't mean what it thought, what it doesn't mean what I thought it meant uh, 40 years ago. It means that, you know, government certainly doesn't mean what I thought it meant 40 years ago, back when I was a naive kid, um, you know, when I grew up in school and stuff like that. We're in a pickle, um, and you know, I the the other thing I read someplace, and I don't know if I'll be able to find it again, but I read yesterday that um, another another component, you know, when you think about it, another component. The uh, I'll, I'll I'll state the fact as it was stated, and and say that I don't have the backup for it right now, um, but somebody said uh, when half of U.S. adults have a sixth grade or less uh, reading level what do you expect is gonna happen when you give everyone the vote, right? Um, uh, I, I saw another tweet today. Um, it was the day after the election that uh, what are tariffs was the, the big search result, right? Um, we made this decision about tariffs post hoc, right? We, we, voted, we, we voted in the guy, we, all of us, um, we voted in the guy who's like, I'm, I'm gonna fix this with tariffs. This is a great and wonderful thing. And of course, we all know, the, the folks in this room know that he doesn't understand tariffs, <laughs> but we still voted for the guy who's fixing it with tariffs. And now after the fact, everybody's like, so what did I vote for with the tariff thing? Is this really a good idea? It's where we are. Um, so I'm not, I believe I, it's, you know, I don't, I think there are, are, situations where we might run out the clock in certain ways or whatever it it might not be that trump ends up being a fascist dictator um in three months or whatever but i'm kind of expecting that it will and and i'm not depressed or um uh or paralyzed or anything like that it's just the 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 fact of the world right and so let's get to work and let's see how it goes so there you go thanks Mm-hmm. Pete, thank you. Um, Mark, I 
I'm impressed that you have such a beautiful collection of distracting things near you, but this is a pretty serious topic and I'm finding what you're doing in your in your gallery window really is making me, it hard for me to stay present for the conversation. So I, I thank you for- That's playing. why and, I turn my video off. Then uh, if you would please do that for a bit until you've got the floor, I'd appreciate it because it's totally blowing my brain. Um, Sam, the floor is yours. Oh, it's me again. Sorry. Ah, it's <laughs> you again. I know. You bumped up um, to the top of the queue. Here you are. <laughs> so let's see. I um, I think of, this is super broad brushstrokes, but I think of it in terms of like left and right extremes. I think of fascism like as an extreme right um, ideology. I think of it in terms of like, this is ours and we're going to take what's ours and we're going to kill anybody who, you know, gets in our way. And, you know, we want it the way we want it. And we don't want any, anything else, anybody else to get in our way. This is our thing, right? And so that's like, sort of like Nazism and, you know, those types of totalitarianisms. And then on the extreme left, there's like, hey, this is the right way. And if you, it, and if you oppose that, then you're, you're wrong and you will be killed. And if you don't share our ideology, if you don't see things the way we see it, if you don't see the correctness of our political c construct, we're going to kill you, you know? And um, and both of those extremes are deadly, you know? But if you look historically, the the left extremes, you look at the, the death tolls of... Okay. You look at the death tolls of, like, right... Like, the Pol Pots versus the Nazis. Like, the Pol Pots win as far as, like, killing people, you know? Um, and so this sort of extremism of thought control, this extremism of, like, you know, you have to believe what we believe is, like, really scary to a lot of people in the world, a lot of right-leaning people in the world. And when you start to have things like um, the, the sort of thought control that manifests as um, censorship and, um, like, manipulation of social media algorithms and um you know and and they have whole they have um, have relatives who are um you know who really um feel this way um and so so you know my part of my mo is that when i'm with left people i talk right and i'm with right people i talk left you know and so um uh oh so um, but my my point here is that, um, like, the insidious totalitarian thought, it's, you know, the thought police thing should scare everybody too. Like, just as much as the, hey, we're, you know, we're right. And it doesn't, we're not, it's not that we're right. It's that we're stronger. And we're going to bonk you on the head and take what's ours. And who cares about the consequences? Because we're stronger. Like, uh, you know, objectively, I'll take that one as long as, you know, like, you know, because either, you know, the, the death tolls are higher. So um, on the other way. So um, uh, hold on. Um, and I was going somewhere. Oh, the um, this idea resonated with me a lot. The, the, the one who betrays the trust is the one who withdraw. I know. I know. I'll get it for you. Um, the one who betrays the trust is the one who withdraws the trust. And so that's not always true. Sometimes you got to like, okay, you've gone far enough there, buddy. You know, and like, I'm hoping we won't get to that point with Trump. But I just, I have a lot of trust in, you know, when I talk with my right-leaning relatives and friends and things, they're not fascists. You know, they're not. They're people who are afraid of totalitarianism and they see it looming in the same way. And they talk about it in the same way that we do um, with just a, just a different, just a slightly different angle, you know, like, I, you know, I, I, you're not going to see, um, you know, your rank and file Republican lining up to make concentration camps for population X. Like you're just not going to see that that's my that's my experience with with that population and and um so like let's 
try, let's just trust each other a little more. Let's like, you know, there, there's some narratives that are so inflammatory and they're so like polarizing. And when you actually like look at it, see the forest for the trees, it just feels like we're being manipulated. Like that's what it feels like to me. It feels like we're being like, I, I've, I, could, I see the same tactics being done on both sides. And I'm like, wow, that looks really convincing. Oh, that looks really convincing. Oh, wait a minute. Either everybody's a freaking psychopath or people are just really good at telling stories. You know, that's what it looks like to me. And um, and all the controversial, all the circumstantial evidence, like all those things that, you know, look, I'm no uh, like, you know, my priorities are environment and, you know, um, and and um, and the environment and the environment kind of, you know, <laughs> like, like women's rights and, you know, um, equality, like a lack of, uh, you know, not scapegoating any population and blah, blah, all those types of things, like certainly. But um and and so you know we're not you're not winning any he's not winning any he's not he didn't win my vote but like he's also he's just an american dude he's some like freaking real estate developer from new york who like liked to, to grab people by the pussy you know like that's who he is he's not like some uber uber like you know machiavellian like mad overlord he's like a douchebag you know <laughs> like, um I don't know, just like, uh, um, just, I think we just all need to be a little bit careful about like believing finely crafted narratives and circumstantial evidence. And let's just like try and like take a step back and see the forest for the trees as far as like, these are, these are all Americans, you know, and they all just like, they all want good things like for them and theirs, you know, and some of them and theirs includes like the trees in the forest and some of them not quite as much. You know, that's kind of how I see it. Thanks, Sam. Oh, and I got to go to babysitters leaving in one minute. All right. so, but thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam. And we've all also just gone through a pretty traumatic election cycle. And uh, let's take a let's take a minute of quiet and just rest with where we are for a second. We've come we're coming up on our it's the first 60 minutes of conversation. So let's let's take a pause. I'll bring us back out of silence in a, in a little bit. I can highly recommend either taking 10 slow, deep breaths or doing box breathing for a little while, which is breathing in, holding it for a bit, breathing out, holding it for a bit, breathing in, holding it for a bit. Both of those will help reset your autonomous nervous system, I think. I'm not sure which, being no neuroscientist. Mark, the floor is yours. Fortunately, I am a neuroscientist. Now, emotions are chemicals. I recommend going to the library. This is not going to work. You have your background blurred, so everything you're showing us is just blurred. Yes, let's unblur that. That would fix it. Sure. Boing. There you go. Everything sad is untrue. Looking for the end of loss. The grief cure. James Thurber. Boy, James Thurber is an American humorist. 
You need James Thurber. My life and hard times. A history of my brief body. Ken Wilbur, the religion of tomorrow. Now, Doctor Who, but with the red TARDIS. Huh. Why is Mark doing this? Because Mark knows that the brain is everywhere and everything. The brain is the most complex thing in the universe. Your brain, Jerry, is more complex than every AI on this planet put together, multiplied by 15 billion factorial. No, your brain, Jerry, Mike, Pete, Doug, John, Alex, Ken, outclasses every computer, every piece of software has bugs. It fails. Do I want to upload my brain onto Windows 95? And cut my throat and become a autonomous robot that can be controlled by Microsoft? No. <laughs> AI, what a stupid thing. Um, 3M, H, uh, you know, uh, whatchamacallit, um, eight inch floppy. Well, can I read this? God knows what's on here. Could be billions of dollars worth of stuff. Is this the microphone that's on? Or is it the microphone in my laptop? You don't know, I'm not telling you. Now, I insist on the difference between stories and systems. The Department of Defense is not a story, it's a system. Trump tells stories, he's a salesman. He sold you. He sold me. Okay. Time to get to work. Work on your systems. I've joined Maker Farm, or I'm planning to join Maker Farm. Maker Farm is cooperative in Alameda. There's pigs, there's goats, there's chickens, and CNC cutter. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, band saws, um, tools, free for everybody to come and use. Bike clinic every third Sunday from 12 to 2, we teach you how to fix bikes. Do it yourself. I'm applying to um, basically get support from Microsoft, the Coast Guard, Catholic Charities, um, to basically fund uh, education bottom up now i live free i'm on disability my rent's paid by catholic charities i get about two grand uh, every two weeks from uh, um, the state of california because i have post-cancer ptsd i survived now what am i doing i'm saying read bucky four i'm saying Who is controlling your mind? The collapsing of what empire? Everything ancient was once new. Give a massage. Mark? Edward Tufti, last and done. Thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Now, I'm trying to be as calm as possible and as quiet as possible. But I'm working my ass off. And I invite you to join me. Because I'm joining you. You are gods. All of you. Every single one of you. Is also Satan. I don't trust any of you. At all. Goodbye. Thank you. Mark, if this is your attempt to be as quiet as possible. it's uh, You must be holding back an awful lot of stuff. Thank you. Mike, please. I've been quietly listening because so much has been very valuable and I, I wanted to make sure I wasn't repeating what others have said and I, I want to bring something new here. As somebody who's lived in Washington since 1988 and even worked in the White House, uh, 
uh, it's been shocking just to see how so many norms and assumptions don't work anymore. Um, so the the question then becomes what what happened, and in addition to the points that people have already made, I thought I would uh, focus on what I consider one of the most important, and that is the 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 end of of truth. And Sam said it in his first remarks, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with a number of his points. But the fact that most Americans, not just 20 or 30 percent or the people who voted for Trump, I, I think most people have just decided they can't figure out what the truth is. They're being lied to so well by so many different people. They have so many different versions of reality. Uh, I am just starting uh, Peter Pomerentsev's third book, which is How to Win an Information War. And at the same time, I'm reading Nexus, finally, all about uh, information networks and their power. But I, I do think we, we have to do some major reinvention, as Hank said, and as Sam said. And people really just rejected the status quo. And I, I think that's the most important thing that very few of the pundits are, are, are emphasizing. Biden had a, 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 such a low approval rating. The survey question they ask every year is, is America on track? It's now 32% or lower. And a lot of the people who normally vote Democrat finally said, look, the system isn't working. And they can see the corruption. They can see the bad policy. They can see the... Uh, lack of competition in the market that allows big companies to, to really dictate the terms. And that's not capitalism, that's crony capitalism. It's the rich and powerful buying more power by buying senators and congressmen. And I think that's what they said. Um, they are really uh, just not looking for just another politician. Trump is in many ways just another politician, except he's more greedy, more corrupt. He knows how to manipulate people. He promises big changes like politicians do, and he's not going to deliver them. And it seems that a lot of people who voted for him understand that, just as they understand he did not build the wall. He did not make Mexico pay for it, but he he made it look like he wasn't a politician. And part of his shtick was to keep saying outrageous things that no sane politician would say, whether about Arnold Palmer or about the cruel things he's going to do to his opponents. And yet people voted for him because he was different. He was promising change and um, I, I think that's that's where we ended up. We ended up with a, a very, very frustrated public willing to grasp at straws and being told incredible lies that made them reject the idea of Kamala Harris as being, being a change agent. Um, she also didn't try to portray herself as a radical change agent or as somebody who would fix at least two or three things. And uh, I really think that's a lot of it. And just to add one more thing that I've heard from a number of people, and these are people who normally would vote Democrat, but they really felt alienated by some of the language used by the progressives, not necessarily by Harris so much, but the progressives who were trying to get everybody to put their pronouns on Twitter and were insisting on calling Latinos, Latin X, even though 90 or 95 percent of Latinos don't ever want to be called that word. It's it's this language barrier that was erected by people who wanted to tag themselves as, you know, more progressive than you just left a sour taste in a lot of of run of the mill Democrats. 
And that is just one cultural uh, issue that I think really pushed a lot of uh, Latinos, particularly Latino males, out of the Democratic fold. So I, I don't know where we're going, but I'm going to focus on truth. Uh, I'm going to use um, uh, everything I can, whether it's uh, my job at Carnegie or the, um, the, the social media that I use. I'm also supporting says.us, Joe Trippi's new platform. And uh, it's only got, you know, probably 10,000 people at this point, but it looks like a very civilized place to have very civilized discussions. It has some of the features of Reddit built in, and I think it also has the identity uh, requirements that will keep the trolls and the, and the bots from taking over that platform like they've taken over Twitter. Sorry for the long rant, uh, but again, thank you for all that you have shared today. And uh, I, I do think we just have to um, really think carefully about how we use language that triggers people in a positive way to think about community, about uniting, and about solving some of the big problems like the lack of trust, the lack of truth rather than trying to figure out some of these very small issues where maybe you've got 43% of the population with you and you're going to try to force it through. Um, I am a pathological optimist, and I, I hope that uh, I'm not finally cured of that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jerry, for doing these incredible calls. Um, Mike, thank you. Uh, thanks in some sense for kind of holding back until you could synthesize a bunch of what showed up here and, and then sharing what you said, because you did a really nice job of, of picking your way through some of the things that I'm feeling as well. Um, and one of the things that came up for me as you were talking was that the Democrats, I think, have are congenitally failing to address actual problems in the country. And they have a series of programmatic answers that everybody's decided really aren't working. Uh, back in the 80s, it used to be called like big government. Democrats are the party of big government was, was the challenge to, to the Dems. And that's just metastasized, I think, to the point where the Dems cannot break out of politics as usual. And there's plenty to say about that. But also what you said is that the Republicans are unlikely to fulfill the threats or the hopeful parts of their mission because they're mostly incompetent. They don't actually pull things off. The government still tries to strangle and rescue things, which to me means we're not going to see a lot of progress on fixing the, the, the stuff that's broke in the next term. And we're going to have another set of tussles until somebody figures out something different because the parties need to shatter and reassemble somehow. And they're not. So I, so I think there's an opportunity to do something extra political I think there's a big opportunity for people, and I'll go look at Says Us and, and see what's up, but I, I think there's a, a real opportunity to do something that's extra political together that makes enormous sense, that wraps arms around everybody without like, hey, where'd you vote? And what do you think? And are we are we heading down the Nazi, the Nazi glide slope um, just to figure out how to make a good country again? Because one of the ways of de-radicalizing people is to give them hope and lives they can look forward to. And, and I don't think either party, I really don't think either party is giving Americans lives to look forward to right now. And that means the political system has failed as a whole. And I want to see what we can do outside of it. As the Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Mm. And I think that we've, we've lacked a vision positive vision or a negative vision it's just we've had confusion i'm going to a uh, tallinn on on uh, sunday cool. for the global digital oh, the tallinn digital summit and i'm looking forward to having some quiet conversations with the, the estonians because they have provided a vision and tried to live towards it and they've also because they broke free of russia they did recreate their entire society. Um, they're struggling in some ways, but um, uh, they might have some really good lessons for me. Thank um, you. Thanks, Mike. And right after Ukraine, they are next in mortal peril from Putin's desires to advance, unfortunately. Yes. Um, Alistair, thank you for being patient. 
Um, thanks, Jerry, for first of all for pausing, you know, reminding us to pause because that's easy to forget. Um, yeah, I just want to note something that uh, Jill mentioned in the one of his posts or one of his emails that uh, when uh, uh, Orban had lost decades ago, like two thousand and one or two thousand and two, uh, he did a lot of, did a lot of uh, uh, civic circles. And I noticed that uh, myself and the left-leaning people around me, who I know, uh, we're comfortable dealing with words and numbers and concepts, and not so comfortable talking to people, you know. And I think that that's a big reason why we don't connect with people, you know. And I don't think that's a solution in itself, because uh, if we talk to people and find that. Uh, I guess many people, uh, the type of politics that I want to see, uh, much of it uh, is about is about uh, overcoming some of our worst instincts, you know, and some of our natural instincts. So just talking to people and saying, oh, well, let's do what they want, you know, the, uh, the first thing that comes to their mind, that's not a good thing. But, uh, but talking to people, uh, uh, you know, and listening, listening to people rather than talking to them or talking at them. Uh, listening to people has to be, I think, part of the what we do, you know, if, we're going, if there's going to be change. Um, yeah, just want to mention uh, two other things. Uh, yeah, someone mentioned the use of the word uh, fascist, and that reminded me that, uh, yes, I mean, uh, people used to use, I guess they still use, you know, the word communist, and it does have some meaning, but... Uh, it becomes so overused, you know, that's, uh, yeah, it just becomes meaningless, you know, it's just, it just means someone I disagree with. Uh, and the second thing, yeah, someone talked about how the people that he knows aren't fascists or Nazis, which is a good thing, but I don't think it's enough, you know, it's not reassuring enough for me, because I think the Nazis managed to do a lot of things, even using people who are normal, you know, uh, just like me and you, sort of, at least a couple, till a couple of years before that. Uh, yeah, so, unfortunately, it's quite possible for you and me to, or people like us, you know, to be coerced into uh, doing quite terrible things. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I was in Berlin many years ago, shortly after the wall came down, and there was an exhibit in part of town where they had banners attached to streetlights, and the banners told stories. And the one, the only one I saw, the one I remember, had a chess piece on one side. I think it was a pawn or a bishop. And on, on the other side, it said, in 1934, whatever date, uh, Germany passed a law prohibiting Jews from joining chess clubs. And it was like, hmm, what constituency doesn't have a strong lobby or any force in the world or whatever, like maybe chess clubs. But as we, as a sub, as several people have reminded us on this call, you have to be vigilant of the, the front wave of something really, truly terrible coming in and taking over. And I'm not trying to ignore that evidence. And as I said also in the chat, if those things start showing up, I will change my tenor considerably. But I'm deeply interested in trying to fix the breach instead of trying to fight back or get revenge or whatever else. I don't know. A, a couple other notes before we, we wrap up a little bit. I'm interested in some comments about this conversation and where we should take these calls. I will be here to host next Thursday's call, but then April and I travel to Australia for three weeks. And I will, um, it's it's a part work, part vacation. And I'm thinking uh, I'm open for clever ideas. We could take a three week hiatus. If someone else wants to host in, in, in someone else's Zoom, that would be really great. I'd be happy to have that as an experiment. Uh, but so next week I, I, I'm is, is normal. And then after that, there's three weeks where <clears throat> I'm basically in motion and likely un, uncapable of uh, joining or uh, happy to be on vacation for a bit. Uh, so let's think about what, you, uh, what you'd like to do, open to proposals on the Mattermost or on the OGM list, any, any ways you'd like to say. Uh, with that, Gil, please. 
Yeah, thanks, Carrie, and thanks everybody for your thoughts and your presence uh, so far. Um, I'm really missing Kevin Jones this morning. Because uh, I think what Kevin's been reporting from Swannanoa uh, and the re response and recovery of the flood disasters there and how people across the political spectrum have come together and been community of the sort that we all envision and dream of and don't have now in our lives uh, is part of the story um, that we're talking about here. Um, worth remembering that if something like 130 million eligible voters didn't vote, almost as many as the total who voted for Harris and Trump. So that's notable when we talk about what we think Americans believe. Um, our data is very skewed, very limited, let's call it that way. Um, yeah, the, the term fascism gets thrown around conveniently as people we don't like, but there are technical definitions of it. The Wikipedia entry on definitions of fascism is really illuminating. Um, and Umberto Eco's uh, I, I found to be very powerful. For me, classically, when I grew up, it was authoritarianism, et cetera, uh, you know, status, nativist, information control, and so forth, coupled with uh, corporate alliance with government. Uh, so that's something to keep our eyes on here. Um, it's notable to me that there's all this conversation about the elites, which is thrown at the Democrats because of education level and uh, cultural interest and geographic convergence. But somehow, you know, Musk and Peter Thiel and the Koch brothers and all the billionaires around Trump are not called elites. So it's part of the very weird conversation about class in America, really different conversation about class than, in, than traditionally in Europe. Um, I would say that the voters did not choose fascism. Nobody was said, do you want to have an authoritarian government? Yes, check the box. There was something else that happens that may get us that, but that's not what people chose. And to the point about uh, information war and distortion and so forth, you know, important to remember, uh, you know, Citizens United is part of that story. The unfettered access of money into into politics is part of the story. Fox News is part of the story. Even CNN, the more moderate uh, network, but you know, gave billions of dollars of free media to Trump in 2016, uh, with delight from their uh, executives. Even even now, um, you know, it reminds me back of the Powell Memorandum of the early 1970s, which laid out the strategy for corporate, uh, expanding corporate power into government. And so you can look at Trump as a random phenomenon of this crazy guy from New York, or you can look at it as the, as the culmination of a 50, a consistently played 50 year strategy, uh, including politics at the local level, farm team development of candidates, money in government and so forth. So uh, not a surprise for those who've been watching that. And there's a film called Heist, The Stealing of the American Dream. Uh, that's an interesting perspective on that. Um, um, yeah, Trump's a politician and politicians lie and he won't deliver on his promises. But my concern is that he'll deliver on his bad promises very well and not on his good promises very well. Um, I like the chess piece story, Jerry. You know, first they came for the chess players. That that famous poem. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, and I wasn't a chess player, so I wasn't worried about that. And eventually the the, the, the ratchet moves along. Um, I, um, let's see, which way to do this? Um, I've, I've watched a little bit of Fox during the election cycle and flipped back to MSNBC, which is where we usually hang out in this household. And I was really struck more than ever before at how much of a propaganda outlet MSNBC is also. Um, you know, not just the relentless drumbeat of a position, but the spinning of what I was seeing. And I've seen a lot of people talk about Trump's mental decline and then show me clips that to me don't look like mental decline. They look like performance artists. And to that point, there's a video, I'll try and find it again, that ostensibly, I, 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 it, I wondered if it was an AI. I don't think it was, but it was a video of Trump uh, and um, Miller and Tulsi Gabbard and a dozen or so other operatives in a hotel room watching Kamala Harris's convention speech and live tweeting it 
and talking together about what they're going to tweet. And Trump, Trump is dictating things and someone's transcribing it, popping the tweets out. Uh, and it was uh, it was impressive, frankly, at how focused and coordinated and systematic and effective it was. And it wasn't a Donald Trump in cognitive decline that I was watching there. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of been thrown off by that story. So somebody, Scott Galloway, maybe was saying, you know, all that stuff of him dancing on the podium for 40 minutes and so forth, intentional designed to throw the narrative off and have people spend their time talking about that bullshit rather than what's going on. Very interesting perspective. Last thing I'll say, no, two last things I'll say. Um, really, There's still so many last things. It's like watching the movie E.T. No. Never, don't ever rewatch E.T. It ends like five times. Or the exterminating angel. Back to angel. you, Gil. Or the exterminating angel, which we, can, we should have a whole session about that at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Rebecca Solnit has been remarkable lately. Read her. Uh, An Anand Jiraharidas I have not seen, but I bet he's saying stuff that's mm -hmm. pertinent here. Um, so truly the last thing. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was really struck when she looked at the data to find that a lot of people who voted for her, for the folks in Europe, she's like, you know, probably the most progressive member of Congress, astute, really articulate about all this stuff. Uh, she found that a lot of the people who voted for, or some large number of people who voted for her voted for Trump. And she was baffled. And she did a very interesting thing. She went out and talked to them. And she asked them why and what they were thinking. And it's enormously enlightening. Uh, and I encourage people to take a look at that. I, don't, I, I posted the link in the chat. Um, so, you know, to what somebody said before about, um, oh, it was, it was, I think, Sam, about like when he's with lefties, he talks with the right, talks from right perspective and with right people, he talks from left perspective. I don't get to talk to very many right wing people just because I live in a bubble and a bubble and a bubble. Uh, but I think the job isn't to talk with them, it's to listen to them. Uh, you know, we don't, part of the problem is that we don't have much opportunity to listen to the other. Uh, AOC offered a gorgeous example of that. Um, so, and Alistair, I really was struck by what you, your observation that the left seems to be more comfortable talking about numbers than talking with people. That really, it's, it's one of the things I really take away from this conversation this morning. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Gail. Yeah. Alex, you might be getting close to the last word here, and I'm hoping Ken has a poem for us. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was going to say a lot of things, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, apologies for the word for introducing the fascism topic, but anyway, Don't I agree. You, Alex, you know, great. So, <laughs> however, what I will say is, there's a. I went to see a play last year called Good. It was in a small play in a small theatre locally here in the UK. And I'll post the narrative and the thing, but it was about, I'll read it. Uh, set in pre-war Germany, it shows how John Holder, a liberal-minded professor whose best friend is the Jewish Maurice, could not only be seduced into joining the Nazis, but step by step, by rationalized step, end up embracing the final solution. That, to me, was a a mind opener on how even if you don't believe in something, you'll end up in a bad place if the circumstances are so. It's worth looking at. Now, it doesn't support my whatever I said about fashion. It's quite the opposite of what I said. But it's it's a very good play because I think both sides are slowly creeping in their own directions in that in that particular direction. Obviously, it's not a final solution, but it's in a place they want you to go to. Um, I just thought I'll post the, the link in the, the chat. But sorry, I could talk for a long time, but no. <laughs> thank you. Um, Pete, thanks for finding the place so quickly. I was worried I wasn't going to be able to find it quickly and and so forth. Alex, feel free to say a bit more about about the play. It sounds fascinating. Oh, it's 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 a very plain, simple play. It's only got two or three actors, three. But and, and I'm I'm a sucker for those sort of simple things that mean a lot. But I've never quite realized, okay, I'm, I don't, I'm not of the Jewish faith or, or religion or anything or, or whatever, um, race and, and so on. So you hear everything about the final solution as a, as a story, as a line. And I never understood how people could ever do that. That's the bit that I was missing. It was just a, 
lines in a book or a story. And when you see this play, you suddenly think, you know, the expression here, by the grace of God, go I kind of thing. If, if the circumstances fall in place, even you will not be able to do anything about it. That's, that's what it gave me. And I finally understood how ordinary Germans could potentially do what they did. I don't know an actual fact what they did or whatever, but it's a good way of seeing it. Um, and it doesn't excuse the people. It's just how you can end up in a place you don't believe in without wanting to, <laughs> just without even realizing at times. And it goes against what I said about the word fascism. It's it's sort of it's on the other side of the, the equation. But I'll go back and say, I'll repeat Sam, and I'll repeat what um, uh, Gil said about not... I talk to all people. I talk to the right, I talk to the left, it's just because I'm desperate to talk. <laughs> I talk to anyone. Um, and you'll be surprised where the right is. You think the right is there, and you probably imagine they're worse than there. But actually, they're a very confused lot at the moment, just as I suspect the left is. But talk, and you'll find out a lot of things we wrap the call with really good advice. Talk. Uh, Gil, briefly, and then Ken. Talk and listen. The good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth that we might listen twice as much as we speak. Learned that from an old farm organizer, Merle Hansen. Um, um, I'm reminded, listening to the last words from Alex, of the 2016 election when a lot of people who were for Bernie Sanders in the primary wound up voting for Trump. And some people, to my mind, simplistically said, oh, Bernie supporters were racists. I think, no, no, no. Bernie supporters were a lot of working class people who had the concerns about their life and economy. And Sanders was speaking to them and Trump was speaking to them and Clinton was not speaking to them. And when they lost the opportunity of Sanders, they went to the only person who they thought was listening to them. Um, in a way, that's bad news. In a way, I find that enormously optimistic about the political potential and future of this country if we have a different kind of conversation. Ken, what do you got for us, man? Another one from Vistava Zimborska. Mm. It's going to make you uncomfortable, just so you know. A little trigger warning if you want to leave now. I won't uh, blame you. It's called torture. Nothing has changed. The body is a reservoir of pain. It has to eat and breathe air and sleep. It has thin skin and the blood is just beneath it. It has a good supply of teeth and fingernails. Its bones can be broken. Its joints can be stretched. In torture, all of this is considered. Nothing has changed. The body still trembles as it trembled before Rome was founded and after, in the 20th century before and after Christ. Tortures are just what they were. Only the earth has shrunk, and whatever goes on sounds as if it's just a room away. Nothing has changed, except there are more people, and new offensives, new offenses Offensives, offenses have sprung up beside the old ones, real, make-believe, short-lived, and non-existent. But the cry with which the body answers for them was, is, and will be a cry of innocence in keeping with the age-old scale and pitch. Nothing has changed, except perhaps the manners, ceremonies, dances, the gesture of the hands shielding the head has nevertheless remained the same. The body writhes, jerks, and tugs, falls to the ground when shoved, pulls up its knees, bruises, swells, drools, and bleeds. Nothing has changed except the run of rivers, the shapes of forests, shores, deserts, and glaciers. The little soul roams among these landscapes, disappears, returns, draws near, moves away, evasive and a stranger to itself, now sure, now uncertain of its own existence, 
whereas the body is and is and is and has nowhere to go. Um, thank you. That's just super powerful. Um, everybody, I'm, it's bittersweet to end on such a note, um, but somehow perfect. Thank you all. Um, see you in a week and many of you on balls in the interim, but thank you for being here. Thank you for a wholehearted conversation about a super important topic. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all the different perspectives you brought.